From prenups to custody battles, our Ask a Lawyer Week continues with a look at the sticky subject of family law. From CTV News, this is Canada AM with Beverly Thompson and Marcy Ian. Good morning. It's Tuesday, February 26th. I'm Beverly Thompson. And I'm Marcy Ian. Coming up on Canada AM, family law is the focus of today's Ask a Lawyer Week segment. And if you've ever wondered what you need to know before signing a prenup, family lawyer Andrew Feldstein will answer that question and others when he joins us in just a couple of minutes. Our Ask a Lawyer Week continues with an area of law that can get very messy. Family law covers everything from divorce to custody disputes to prenups. Here to answer your emails today is Andrew Feldstein. He is a senior partner at Feldstein Family Law Group. Thank you for taking part in this and got some tough questions to tackle in a short amount of time, so we want to get right to it. This is from Lee, this first question. At what age can a child with which parent he or she wants to reside, what steps must be taken? taken to allow this to happen? Well, to begin with, there isn't a clear-cut age where a child can decide what, where they want so to live. So it's not 16 or 17 or 18, there's no specific... There's not a magic age. Part of it depends on the maturity of the child, the reasons for the child. So a, children, a child who is 12 or 13 years old may express their opinions, and if the matter was before a court, in Ontario, a court would appoint the Office of the Children's Lawyer, or may appoint the Office of the Children's Lawyer, and that would mean either a social worker and or a lawyer would meet with the child, hear the child's opinions, and try to understand why the child wants to live with one parent or the other to ensure that the child isn't just repeating what one parent wants them to say. Right, because that's the tough part, is to make sure that it is, in fact, the child's feelings. Absolutely. That are being expressed. Okay. Um, so the next question we have is an email. This one is from Robert. My common law wife of 30 years and I split up. We jointly owned a home. She moved out five years ago and I still live in the house. We both want to sell, but she's being slow in getting her stuff out. She has refused to pay half the taxes and the insurance on her house. It's in the thousands. What can I do? Well, in his situation, he can commence a court action for the partition and sale of the home, and the law is very straightforward that if there's joint owners, especially in a common law situation, that the home would be sold. The issue that he needs to consider and think about is, what else is he going to raise? Does she have a claim for spousal support against him after a 30-year relationship? And if you take an aggressive tack for the sale of the home, she may come and say, I want some spousal support now. So that would negate the fact that he says that she's not paying for tax. Like if it's a jointly owned home, could he push for her to pay the property taxes? He could try, but the offset for that would be her saying, you've had the benefit of being in the home. And if there isn't very much of a mortgage, how much did he have to pay to live there? What would it compare to paying rent on a home? Okay, so our next question. I am engaged and my fiancé has agreed to sign a prenuptial agreement. What should I know before I sign it? What should I be including on my end? Well, before any prenuptial agreement, or we call the marriage contracts, mm -hmm. is signed, you need to have full, frank financial disclosure, meaning you need to understand what agreement you're getting yourself into. What does your spouse make? What do they have? Because what are you contracting out of? And, what, and you need to consult the lawyer and make sure you have a lawyer review the agreement because if somebody is giving you an agreement and you're 25 years old that says, I'm never going to pay you spousal support mm -hmm. and I'm not going to give you any division of uh, property, well, what happens 30 years later? It's a pretty unfair deal that would probably yeah. be set aside, but you shouldn't sign it. So in most cases in this world of prenuptial agreements, I guess, in which we live, is it something that, generally speaking, is drawn up for the benefit of both people, or does it tend to be someone drawing it up who seems to think that that person has more money, therefore you must sign? Well, it's usually somebody has a motivation to do it, but the question is what's the motivation and what's the reason and what are the objectives of it? Because if you want an agreement that is really one-sided, like the one I just suggested, mm -hmm. It's not gonna, it probably will not be enforceable years later, much like in the recent McCain and McCain case that was all over the news. So the McCain and McCain case, um, enlighten us or remind us? That's the Wallace, I think it was, I shouldn't say Wallace McCain, it's, but uh, one of the McCain yes. heirs, and they had a marriage contract that was set aside by the court, and the spousal support the wife got was about $175,000 right. a month. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, now I do remember that. that mm -hmm. didn't okay, so um, lastly we have a question. Do I have to disclose all of my assets to my spouse and what about my inheritance? 
Absolutely. In family law, you need to disclose all of your income, all your assets, all your liabilities. If you get an inheritance, the important piece is from the day you receive it, you need to show it coming in as an inheritance, and you have to trace it all the way through to the date of separation. So if you spend the inheritance, you don't get to keep it. And the exception as well is if you put it into the matrimonial home, for example, paying down the mortgage, mm -hmm. which is what most people will do, it's gone. You no so longer then that get to home exclude it. is jointly held, therefore whatever money goes into it is also jointly held? Exactly. Otherwise an inheritance, so what should you do if you have an inheritance that comes to you, um, well I guess before or during a marriage? Well, from a family law perspective, if you get an inheritance during the marriage, the, the best route to take is to go open an investment account at a completely different institution than you deal with and leave the money in that account and let it grow there and don't mingle it with anything else. That's offset against practical reality of the fact most people want to pay a mortgage down. And you may want to protect it with a marriage contract at that point, which you could do during the course of your marriage. Is that popular or common now that people would draft a, a I guess, a, a, a post-nup, really? It, exactly. It's not popular, but that would be an option. And, but the practical reality, again, is what happens when you're 15 years into a marriage and you get an inheritance and you go to your spouse and say, I need a contract to protect my inheritance. That may end the marriage right there. Well, that could be an argument for sure. Tell me what to, what holds up in court when we're talking about prenups. What are the what are the kinds of prenuptial agreements that are most likely to stand up? Well, one of the weird exceptions in family law is that if I come into the marriage and I have five hundred thousand dollars in my bank account, when I separate, I get to deduct that five hundred thousand. So because essence, that's I, what you had going in. Exactly, but if what I had going into the marriage was my house and that house is still my matrimonial home on the date of marriage, and I had 500000 of equity in it, I have to share that because it was the matrimonial home. And in addition to that, that home might be worth more money on the market. It and will that be also worth gets doubled back in. That also, but that's less offensive because it's not as if you're losing out on what you brought in. At least that's growth that you shared during the course of the marriage. So if you did a marriage contract that says, I want to protect that $500,000 I'm bringing into the marriage, that type of contract is certainly going to apply. But it's hard to predict which type of contract is going to stick with certainty and not. At the end of the day, what's really important is try and be fair in the contract. Mm -hmm. Don't try and do something that is really extreme and one-sided because that's where a judge is going to want to help out the other side. And when you talk about it as a contract, does it then have to be signed? Should, should it be signed by a lawyer? Should it be like a will that's notarized? Well, every separation agreement, marriage contract, domestic contract in Ontario has to be signed and witnessed. Should it be done by a lawyer? Well, one of the first things that's going to happen with any contract is you're going to look at it and say, was there independent legal advice? It's not completely fatal if there wasn't, but if there is, it certainly gives a better opportunity to suggest that the side who doesn't like the contract uh, knew and understood what they were getting themselves into. Okay, good information, Andrew Feldstein. Thank you so much for coming in. And thank you for having me. You bet. Our Ask a Lawyer series continues tomorrow when we answer your questions about employment law.